Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad you were able to join us for today's lecture, The Way Forward on Race, with Dr. Teresa Reed. Dr. Reed holds a PhD from Indiana University, where she studied music theory, music history and literature, and African American history. She spent 25 years at the University of Tulsa, serving there as a professor of music, director of the School of Music, associate dean, and director of the African American Studies Certificate. She has also authored three books, two of which have won national awards. She currently serves as Dean of the School of Music at the University of Louisville. Her first, fourth book, You Are Likely Not a Racist, Answers for Curious White People, is forthcoming later this year. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Reed. Thank you very, very much for that welcome. Thanks to the Filson Historical Society for having me. And thanks to all of you for joining this afternoon. Just a few weeks ago on April 29th, Senator Mitch McConnell and about 30 of his colleagues sent a letter to Dr. Miguel Cardona, Secretary of Education. Their letter expressed grave concern that the teaching of American history was being directed towards a quote, politicized and divisive agenda, end quote. In particular, the letter condemned the 1619 Project, exclaiming that, quote, families did not ask for this divisive nonsense, end quote, arguing further that Americans never decided that our children should be taught that our country is inherently evil. Shortly following, Senator McConnell gave a press conference here in Louisville, during which he reiterated his disagreement with what he called the exotic notion that 1619 was an important year in American history. This statement ignited a firestorm and drew sharp criticism and a strong reaction from many. On May 6, the University of Louisville's Interim Senior Associate Vice President for Diversity and Equity, Dr. Faye Jones, issued a response noting that, quote, the recent statements made by Senator Mitch McConnell during a press conference in Louisville this week are quite troubling for American descendants of slaves, our allies, and those who support us." End quote. The letter distributed campus-wide campus rejected Senator McConnell's statement and affirmed that 1619 was indeed a critical year in America's history. Please keep this incident in mind while I go back a few years to describe a parallel incident involving syndicated talk show host, Dr. Laura Schlesinger. In August 2010, celebrity talk radio host Dr. Laura Schlesinger, popularly known as Dr. Laura, took a call from the Black wife in an interracial marriage who was distressed at her husband's dismissal of his friend's racist remarks. Dr. Laura derided the caller for being hypersensitive, pointing out that Black comics on HBO and famous Black rappers and other entertainers use the N-word all the time. To make her point, and to ask what the big deal was, Dr. Laura repeated the N-word several times in rapid succession for her national radio audience to hear. She asserted that if Black people could use the N-word, then she should be able to use it as well. And why should anyone find this offensive? It was 2010, and Dr. Laura further lamented that even with a Black president, there was, quote, more complaining than ever from Black people, end quote. That broadcast went viral, sparking quite the firestorm. Dr. Laura lost sponsorship and within days resigned from her radio show. The flashpoint around Dr. Laura's use of the N-word underscores a common dysfunctional pattern when we attempt to communicate across our differences about race. Buried within her offensive remarks and hidden within its painful impact was a very legitimate question. If the N-word is so offensive, why do black people themselves use it? If I were white, I would likely find it profoundly confusing as did Dr. Laura, that black entertainers use the term and make money while whites use the same term and lose their credibility and their jobs. If I were white, would I, if I were white I would also likely suffer from a sort of blindness intrinsic to the privilege that characterizes my very existence it would be enormously difficult for me as a white American to comprehend how my own critical knowledge gaps help to fuel the racial discontent that fill our news and makes race so hard 
to discuss. Today, I wanna to talk about two paradigms, the first of which fails us repeatedly, and a new paradigm that I believe holds promise for moving us all closer to the table of brotherhood that Dr. Martin Luther King described in his dream in 1963. I'm gonna ask Scott to pull up the PowerPoint and I'd like to share with you a graphic uh, that represents uh, the current paradigm. And this illustrates why conversations about race are either repeatedly stalled or are difficult to have at all. The phases of the cycle are, there's a knowledge gap. And then there is a flashpoint. And you can see that connected to this flashpoint off to the side is uh, a recognition of some trauma, 400 years of trauma that you both can see and that you can't see. And then there comes an outcry. Someone speaks out and a consequence follows. And then there is retreat and abandonment, which invariably takes us right back to the knowledge gap. The case of Dr. Laura matched all five phases of this cycle. Here is a white woman who meets every metric for membership in this country's elite, yet she suffers from an acute deficiency in her knowledge about the dynamics of race. In speaking with her caller, she exposes her knowledge gap, expresses her curiosity and asks, albeit offensively, a very legitimate question about the racial disparity in usage of the N-word. Curiosity about race often comes from a genuine place with all good intentions and a simple desire to know. However, because there have never been any educational structures to inform white people and equip them with the interpersonal and conversational skills necessary to present their curiosity or to formulate or contextualize their questions or to otherwise safely and appropriately expose gaps in their knowledge, Many white Americans with even the best and noblest of intentions have no way of gauging the impact of what they express, however innocently that query might have been originally formulated. This is exactly what happened when Dr. Laura expressed her confusion and curiosity about why she couldn't use the N-word. When her radio audience heard her defiant, repeated use of the N-word, Black listeners, not exclusively, but in particular, experienced her discourse as an attack, a flashpoint that triggered a reaction, not just to that particular broadcast, but a reaction grounded in a broader context of centuries old trauma with which that particular word has long been associated. There was an outcry followed by the consequence that Dr. Laura's show lost General Motors as a sponsor. Finally, she retreated by quitting her show and in public at least, abandoning her curiosity, which brought us right back around to the knowledge gap that she started with in the first place. The tragedy here is that if Dr. Laura is brave enough to expose her knowledge gap again, or even if she does it unintentionally, sort of in the run of conversation, unless something changes, this cycle is likely to repeat. When we speak about race-based educational disparity in this country, the traditional assumption is that people of color are exclusively on the losing end of the spectrum. We usually reference the historical denial of educational access and opportunity to people of color and an equity that the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954, for example, was intended to help correct. The troubling racial and political polarization in our country today, however, makes it abundantly clear that deficiencies in education have impacted our country in much more widespread and complex ways. Until now, relatively little attention has been given to race-based educational disparity from the opposite lens. While Black Americans begin to study learn and practice the histories, the norms, the expectations and worldviews of whiteness from birth. An immersive multi-directional education that we get from nearly every type of consumption from school to popular culture and mass media and from the experience of navigating through every dimension of upward mobility. White Americans in turn get virtually nothing of a comparable education about blacks and people of color. 
Our country's power structure makes it not only possible, but in some ways advantageous even for white Americans to ascend to the most prominent levels of educational, political, economic, and military achievement with little to no exposure or experience that properly informs them about people of color. The problem therefore isn't simply racism. The problem is acute and widespread ignorance. Through no fault of their own, many white Americans are born into and suffer for much of their lives from a state of educational anemia when it comes to understanding the histories and perspectives of blacks and other people of color and moving beyond stereotypes and inaccurate assumptions to make real sense of why black people do the things we do. To fix this, let's embrace a new paradigm. And Scott, I'm gonna ask you to go to page, to page two of the, the slide two of the PowerPoint. In my mind's eye, I've replayed the scenario with Dr. Laura again and again, and I've imagined a different kind of exchange and as a result, a different outcome. I imagined that through some weird and unlikely turn of events, I'd actually have the opportunity to meet Dr. Laura face to face. Now in reality, there's no way or reason that our paths would ever actually cross, but I'm just using my imagination. Maybe I'd run into her at the airport and our flights are canceled and we're both trapped there with lots of time and drinks and snacks and no place else to go. I imagine myself striking up a conversation with her because despite her debacle of 2010, I actually like her as a person and more importantly, I, I see her humanity. I'd introduce myself and put her at ease, buy her a cup of coffee and I'd gently guide her back to her unanswered questions from 11 years ago. So Laura, what I heard you saying is you'd really like to know why black people get away so easily with using the N-word, right? I gently touch her on the shoulder, reassuring her that curiosity is a good thing and it's safe and okay to ask. And I'd, let, I'd take my time with the good explanation that she deserves because race is a topic too sensitive and complex to address in a sound bite a factoid or in a few politically correct cliches. As her newfound friend, I would give her a clear, thorough and non-judgmental explanation to resolve her confusion as to why African-Americans use the N-word while she cannot. And I would give her an explanation using this analogy. Imagine that your two legs are exactly the same except that one is encumbered and the other is not. One leg is free and flexible with the ability to bend and move and dance however it wills. The other leg, however, is bound by a 400 pound ball and chain that is excruciatingly painful to drag along. Every effort to move that leg is a reminder of all that burdens, oppresses, and constricts it. The N word is linguistically unique in this country in that it derives its meaning most powerfully, not from its etymology, nor from context, nor from vocal inflection, but it derives its meaning most strikingly from the person who utters it. When African-Americans use the N word, it is completely deracialized. That is to say that the sting and the poison are absent. When used by blacks, the N word can have a range of meanings and can even be a lighthearted term of endearment. It's a norm of African-American culture to redefine and repurpose. And this is evident in our cuisine, in the way we do religion, certainly in our music and in our use of language, whatever is at hand to serve creative or expressive function. In the same way that we have transformed pig intestines into a coveted del delicacy that we call chitlins, language has also been at our disposal to flip on its head, turn inside out and make it mean what we want. That freedom and flexibility, that versatility in African-American expression is like the flexibility and fluidity of the unencumbered leg in our two leg analogy. I would explain further to Dr. Laura that when someone white utters the N word, by contrast, its meaning instantly transforms. When spoken by a white voice, the N word automatically triggers the history of oppression at the hands of white hegemony and the resulting inequality that persists through to the present day. Upon white utterance, the N word connects to the brutality of bondage and the heartbreak of families splintered and spouses and children bought and sold as chattel 
during slavery, to Jim Crow segregation that persisted through the 1960s, to government sanctioned redlining in real estate, to lynching, to mass incarceration, police brutality, voter suppression, and other painful realities of the past four centuries, the impacts of which are felt today. That's the other leg and our two leg analogy, the one bound by the heavy ball and chain. So you see, Laura, I would explain, this is why your use of the N word was so problematic, but I forgive you because you were disadvantaged by a system that did not properly teach you and therefore you simply didn't understand. I imagine that over coffee, both of our cups now refilled for a second and third round, Dr. Laura and I are continuing our conversation. We're beginning to let our guards down and she feels free to follow up on another one of her comments during her infamous radio rant. She feels that our discussion is safe. So she asks, in 2010, Barack Obama was president. I thought black people would be satisfied, but they seemed angrier than ever. Instead of complaining, why didn't black people just celebrate such wonderful progress. Some questions may appear so naive as to sound insulting and it may take effort for me to persist and resist the pattern of perceived attack that activates the other phases of the dysfunctional cycle, thereby threatening to abruptly end our conversation, derail our newfound friendship and stall the progress of dialogue in a pothole of anger, hurt and distrust. That pattern simply gets us nowhere. So I make a different choice. And I make this choice because it's, because it's only for myself that I have the power to choose. And at times it may feel counterintuitive and may take purpose-driven effort. I then explained to Dr. Laura that while we certainly celebrated this important first, Barack Obama was also distinguished as the only president whose American citizenship was challenged in a series of ongoing highly publicized legal and political gestures that predated his presidency and continued for nearly his entire time in the White House. In 2004, Illinois politician Andy Martin became the first to suggest that Obama was not an American. In 2008, Clinton supporters circulated emails questioning Obama's citizenship, which ultimately for forced Obama to publicly release for the first of at least two times his birth certificate. That same year, a series of lawsuits were filed challenging Obama's eligibility for the presidency based upon doubtful citizenship. In 2009, a highly publicized Kenyan birth certificate purported to be Obama's appeared in the media and on eBay. In April 2011, Obama released his long form birth certificate. Despite this, from 2011 to 2016, Donald Trump led the birtherism charge questioning Obama's citizenship repeatedly during televised interviews and encouraging his base to do the same. Finally, in September, 2016, Trump sheepishly conceded that Obama was born in America. I would say to Dr. Laura, so you see, Obama's presidency was both an important first and a painful reminder that if you are brown in this country, you can ascend even to the presidency and still be viewed by many as unworthy, inadequate, and imposter. I sense that Dr. Laura is neither malicious nor hateful and she may not even be a card carrying racist. Instead, Dr. Laura's dilemma, Dr. Laura's problem, simply put, is ignorance that she inherited from the condition of her privilege. And sitting here with her over coffee in a quiet space, I have the power if I'm willing to begin to address her ignorance and to help guide her in filling her knowledge gap. My imaginary exchange with Dr. Laura where her knowledge gap is not ignored but is addressed and curiosity is re resolved realizes the phases in the new paradigm that I propose. So on this slide, slide two, you see that there is the knowledge gap. And then there is a space for flashpoint when that knowledge gap is exposed because the trauma is real, it doesn't go away. After that though, instead of going to outcry, we do something different. We go to risk, teach and learn, which then leads to better understanding and then the objective of not just tolerance, but let's go a step higher and go for friendship, empathy and understanding. 
So here the cycle begins the same way. The knowledge gap is exposed, space is retained for the flashpoint because after all, there's a lot of pain, but we go to risk, teach and learn. And that leads to improved understanding and that leads to empathy and ideally friendship where trust and equity prevail and the exchange of knowledge can continue in an ongoing and meaningful way. And this is how we begin to chip away at racism and build a foundation for friendship based upon honesty and equality. Let's return now to Senator McConnell's recent statement and look at how the old paradigm plays out and how the new paradigm might apply. Thank you, Scott, you can take down the, um, the PowerPoint. By stating that 1619 was unimportant in American history, he exposed an egregious knowledge gap, an educational deficiency linked directly to the condition of his birth and his privilege. He was born in 1942 and came of age in the segregated South where the prevailing worldview placed white men at the absolute top of the social, political, economic hierarchy. McConnell then came to Louisville for high school and college where the textbooks he very likely read and the studies he likely engaged would have immersed him in a particular narrative of American history in which white men of wealth and power were glorified for their inherent greatness, having heroically pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps, building this great country as great men were naturally inclined to do. I have no idea which courses he would have taken at Manual or at UofL, but I do know that he graduated with his BA in 1964, at which time African-American or other ethnic studies courses were extremely rare. As he ascended to positions of leadership, this narrative of white male greatness would have served him well in his own rise to power and pursuit of greatness. This narrative for him and for his entire peer group became I would argue, sacred truth. In this regard, Senator McConnell is exactly like all the rest of us. We are all selective in the information we seek and value, and we have a tendency to ignore, toss aside, devalue, or otherwise develop an oblivion to that which we deem irrelevant to our own lives and our own sense of worth. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, white men, generally speaking, could get along just fine, knowing very little to nothing about African-American history. Senator McConnell would have had no particular need to engage with any African-American voices or perspectives, nor did he need any meaningful or authentic relationships with people of color in order to make his way through life, to build his career, and to achieve political success. From the moment he was born, the deck was already stacked in his favor. And his reality, the reality that placed white maleness in the center and at the top was the only reality that mattered. And that fact, that fact is precisely the reason for the knowledge gap that places someone like Senator McConnell on this hamster wheel of a cycle in which his handling of race repeatedly exposes his knowledge gaps, triggering negative and angry reactions reactions that he may experience as hurtful and that he may not even entirely understand unless someone teaches him and he is receptive to learning. History is always filtered through the lens of the one telling it. I was one of millions of school children who grew up learning about the great achievements of our founding fathers. We were told that these were men of power and influence, the architects of our democracy. The school day began with singing my country tis of thee sweet land of liberty and reciting the pledge of allegiance, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. It was not until adulthood that I learned that 12 of those founding fathers, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, James K. Polk, Zachary Taylor, Andrew Johnson, and Ulysses S. Grant were owners of enslaved African American people. For those enslaved, this was no sweet land of liberty. This for them was a land of bondage where their very lives were the currency that bought liberty, wealth, and privilege for the white people who owned them. How does one enter into a risk, teach, learn conversation with Mitch McConnell. In my new paradigm for race relations, 
Scott, if we could return to page two of the slide deck. The end goal is not just tolerance, but friendship. And before there can be friendship, there must be honesty, vulnerability, truth, and trust. My closest friendships with white people in my life were not made possible by diversity training, although diversity training is often a good and necessary thing. Instead, my white friends are my friends because I can tell them my truth and they are not afraid to hear it. I create safety for them, they create safety for me. And if this country is ever going to heal from its racial sickness, that's what we have to do. We have to tell the truth and we have to be honest about our stories our pains, our histories, and we have to make safe spaces for that honesty to flow without hindrance or revision because it is in fact the truth that sets us all free. Mitch McConnell made those statements and holds those beliefs because he is the victim of an educational experience that reinforced his sense of superiority but failed to properly teach and prepare him for the day that he would have to share the world with an ever increasing population of color. In stating that the year 1619 was insignificant to American history, he inadvertently revealed many things that perhaps he simply doesn't know. This is the knowledge gap. Perhaps he doesn't know that 1619 is widely recognized by African Americans as the year we officially enter the American story. Now, certainly there were African people and enslaved individuals in colonial America prior to that year. And if historians have debated as to whether those arriving in 1619 were enslaved or indentured servants, the fact remains that black people broadly consider 1619 as the year we arrived on the scene in about the same way that Christians broadly consider December 25th as their reference point for the birth of Christ, even though biblical scholars would challenge that. So the year 1619 has definite significance and meaning for Black Americans. Perhaps he doesn't know that when he said 1619 was not a significant date, what Black people actually heard was him declaring in a rather flippant way that the African American story does not matter. Perhaps he doesn't know that the free labor of enslaved Africans was the currency that paid for this country's infrastructure enslaved African people constructed the White House, the Capitol building, and the early buildings where government business was conducted. Enslaved African people constructed the buildings on the campuses that educated many of this country's elite. Right now, the University Studying Slavery Consortium, you can Google it, consists of some 60 colleges and universities in the US and around the world that are coming to terms with ways that enslaved Africans and profits from the slave trade contributed to their existence and growth. Some of these institutions of higher learning include Brown, the Citadel, Clemson, the College of William and Mary, Columbia, Georgetown, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, Princeton, Rutgers, Wake Forest, Xavier, and Yale. Think of all of the presidents senators and congressmen who earned their credentials by taking classes in buildings built by enslaved Africans who were themselves forbidden to learn to read or write, who were forbidden to earn and keep wages, who had no power to choose their marriage partners, protect their children, or keep their families together. Perhaps the senator does not know that centuries of free labor from enslaved Africans transformed the United States into a global economy and that the commodified lives of enslaved African people created profit for some of this nation's wealthiest financial institutions, some of which exist today. Some of these corporations include Lehman Brothers, Adna Insurance, JP Morgan Chase, New York Life, Wachovia Corporation, Norfolk Southern Railroad, and others. In 2005, J.P. Morgan Chase issued a statement noting that its research, quote, found that between 1831 and 1865, two of its predecessor banks, Citizens Bank and Canal Bank in Louisiana, accepted approximately 13,000 enslaved individuals, enslaved human beings, as collateral on loans and took ownership of approximately 1,250 of them when the plantation owners defaulted on the loans, end quote. Perhaps the Senator does not know 
that psychologists have identified and are studying unique ways that African Americans today embody generations of race-based trauma and that the residual effects of slavery are very much with us in modern times. Perhaps the Senator does not know the graphic details of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, redlining, lynching, and the loophole in the 13th, um, in the 13th Amendment that is linked to the modern day mass over-policing and incarceration of people of color. And while we recognize the brutality, inhumanity, and oppression that brought the majority of Africans to these shores, and while we never ever credit slavery for anything at all, let me be clear in saying that there was nothing good, no benefit, no blessing whatsoever in that cruel and irrational institution. We do indeed celebrate and honor the incredible transcendence creativity and resourcefulness of those enslaved persons and their descendants who gave America blues, ragtime, jazz, and rhythm and blues without which there would be no rock and roll and nothing even remotely akin to what we now take for granted as American popular culture. Had Africans not entered the American story, the, me the medical advances credited to HeLa cells would not exist. HeLa cells were taken from Henrietta Lacks, a poor black woman who was the descendant of enslaved African-Americans. He lost cells revolutionized by medical research, contributing to medical breakthroughs related to everything from zero gravity in outer space to the polio vaccine, to the study of treatments for leukemia, AIDS, and cancer. These and other facts too numerous to list here are the reasons that 1619 matters a great deal, not just for black people, but for all of America. It matters that those 1619 arrivals and their descendants and those enslaved Africans who would follow labored, suffered, and survived to produce a baby boy born to an enslaved mother on a Virginia plantation in about 1854. That slave boy, Dennis Mahone, was emancipated at the age of 11, grew up and made his way to Alabama where he married and had a daughter who escaped the Jim Crow South by heading north with her children to Chicago, where her daughter had my mother, who had me. Like many Black Americans and enlightened white allies of people of color, my initial reaction was to cringe when I heard Dr. Laura use the N-word. And my initial reaction was to cringe when Senator McConnell minimized the year that my story began. And while Mitch McConnell has made me cringe on more occasions than I care to, care to count, the fact is that he is a human being whose humanity and vulnerability and whose disadvantage at the hands of his own privilege, I am forced to recognize because compassion is the cornerstone of my religion. To help with the process of rich, risk, teach and learn, I've written a book. Scott, could you show the third and final slide? The title is You're Likely Not a Racist, Answers for Curious White People, and it'll be out later this summer and available in all the usual ways through Amazon and other outlets. If we do what we've always done, we'll get what we've always gotten. Those of us who live a life of scholarship are devoted to the search, discovery, and dissemination of knowledge, and we embrace the contemplation of new ideas. If we do our jobs well, we impact those we teach to do the same. I am ready for things to be different, to be better. Let's risk, teach, learn, and grow together, looking history bravely in the face while keeping the goal of friendship across our differences clearly in our view. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Reed. That was that was really a wonderful presentation and and um, and let me say, I appreciated your, your empathy and search for humanity in this conversation, which can be so tense and fraught. Um, that is, is, is the goal of the Filson Historical Society is to, is to bring people together over conversations like this about our shared past. Um, I would encourage all of our audience members to put some questions into the chat. We've had a few that have been uh, pre-submitted and I'll uh, read from those as we uh, wait for our audience to contribute more, please do. Um, what resources can we use to learn more about African-American history and culture? Thank you, that's a great question. And uh, there are a, a number of 
of resources that, um, you know, at the risk of, of mentioning some, I will, I will omit others, but Henry Louis Gates, Henry Louis Gates is a, a scholar who has produced a number of writings and a number of uh, video projects that put together the African-American story in very clear and concise ways. And if I had to give one answer, and I'll do that here, just give, really give one answer about where to start. I would start with a video series by Henry Louis Gates called The African-Americans. And I believe it's a six part video series. It's uh, available, widely available for purchase. And it sort of walks through, uh, Af it's sort of an African-American history 101 for, for those who have very little knowledge and who want to, to get into, um, who want to, to study and get into um, this topic and get some context. Um, there are other uh, authors. Um, Kendi's written a very important uh, book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, and there are a number of other important books today that deal with the topic, numerous books that deal with the topic. I would start with Henry Louis Gates and his work. That's really fantastic recommendation. Um, we've got another pre-submitted question, uh, and, and again, I applaud the, the vulnerability um, that, that comes from, from asking this question. Um, haven't all ethnic groups been victims of hate and discrimination at one time or another? You know, that's probably true, but we do have to recognize the uniqueness of the American, uh, the American treatment of race. So I mentioned a 1619, and one of the distinctions to make clear is that there were enslaved Africans brought by the Spanish colonies before 1619, but that was a different kind of enslavement, completely different flavor, if you will, of enslavement. The enslavement that begins 1619 was English enslavement. And that particular kind of, uh, of oppression placed a, a new and different and particular emphasis on an inequality based entirely upon race, keeping the races separating, right, separated and distinguishing the value of people according to race. That was a unique kind of, uh, that was a, a unique uh, kind of, of relationship that that institution started. And it has everything to do with the inequality that you see today. So, I mean, you could even go back to uh, Africa and see that there was enslavement of people in Africa by other Africans. The difference is that the American slavery, uh, particularly as administered by the English, was based upon race, and it was also hereditary, and it was also perpetual. Those are factors that made the system particularly brutal in a unique way, in a unique way that other groups have not experienced. Absolutely. And I, I think those, pointing out those variations, as you suggest, you know, changing that context, the legal structures that surround slavery um, is, is really critical. I know at the Filson, we do a lot of research on, on the peculiarities of Upper South slavery. There is this persistent myth in Kentucky history that slavery is somehow better here uh, than it is in the Deep South. And, and you know, we had to push back very gently against that idea and say different perhaps, um, but, but, but not that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we had a really uh, fascinating question just come in through the chat. Um, uh, what, what are your visions for the ways that, that interested white people and people of color can come together and have these conversations? How are those best facilitated? Is that, is that small group conversations? What's the best way that we can keep this going? Absolutely. I'll tell you what we've done um, here at U of L in the School of Music. As a matter of fact, that's my day job. <laughs> the School of Music is, is my unit. That's my, my, my crew, my, my family, where I work and, and spend most of my energy. So here's what we did. Uh, beginning last year, about about a year ago now, uh, right after the events surrounding the Breonna Taylor killing, uh, President Ben uh issued a statement that affirmed the university's commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. And she asked the uh, heads of the units to each send their own messages um, with that affirmation. And so I, I did, I, I wrote a letter to the School of Music that actually travel to other places, but the gist of it was that uh, there are conversations we need to have. And so we literally did that. We started a series 
called Safe Saturday Conversations About Race. And we held those uh, starting out every Saturday morning in June of last year and over the past, around, about the past year, we held about 27 of those conversations, an hour and a half on Saturday mornings on a Zoom call. And we made it very clear that the ground rules, the ground rule was safety. Anybody could join the, the Zoom call and ask anything. Nothing would be off limits. Uh, the environment would be welcoming and non-judgmental, and we would address the knowledge gaps in ways that were safe and that would acknowledge the uh, disadvantage that anyone finds him or, self, him or herself in when they are dealing with a toolkit that's not complete. They don't have all of the information that they need. And so those conversations became really fruitful and they uh, extended beyond the School of Music. We had people calling in from uh, we never had a huge group. I think uh, we had around 30 on any, on any given Saturday where people could ask anything at all. And the, the first rule was that your question is safe to ask. So uh, taking a break on that in the summer and we will uh, initiate those conversations again on a monthly basis beginning with the new school year. But I would encourage folks to start their own groups and set, those, set the framework as one of safety where it's okay to ask. Um, you cannot know what you have not learned and you cannot learn what you have not been taught either by someone or by life. So we have to hold out compassion for each other. That's that's absolutely. And and I know from our experience uh, at the Filson, we we arranged one of those groups with our colleagues at UofL Special Collections and and especially during 2020, which was a very isolating time. Um, with these big pressing questions that were, were coming at us from all aspects of life, it was it was quite a relief to have that 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 open space to be able to talk very freely. So I'll, I'll second the the power of a small group like that. I really wanted to pick up on something that you just mentioned about this incomplete toolkit, and I think that's a very powerful metaphor um, for for this lack of this this knowledge gap uh, and all the ways that that's created. I thought about that in my own professional context as a historian, as someone who, who uh, builds an archive that other historians come and research at. You know, the Filson has recognized that for all of the collecting that we have done of this region's history, we have over collected certain groups and under collected other stories. And there is this, this imbalance of representation within our collections. And, you know, there are two ways around that for us. There is one trying to, to uh, go back and do more cataloging and indexing to find um, the stories that are hidden in the papers that we do have. And then the, the alternative is to go out and collect more um, and, and alleviate those. I wondered if you could reflect on um, this, this, um, this incomplete toolkit from your own professional background in higher education, thinking about, and I love both the points that you made about formal education, but also this, this, this informal education in mores and cultural norms and things? Well, I think that it's important for us to adopt the posture of lifelong learners. It never gets done. You know, I think at the point that any of us decides we've arrived, what we've essentially done is announced how much further we have to go. So I believe that um, the healthiest posture to adopt is, is one of curiosity, and openness and, and humility. Um, I am still learning from my students, from my colleagues, from, from my family. Uh, I'm still learning and I'm still uh, coming to terms with, you know, one of the problems of being uh, an aging academic is that unless you are connected with young people, you quickly become dated, irrelevant and out of touch. You don't see things in the way that the population of this day sees them. And so you really need that grounding influence of perspectives that can, can, speak, into, uh, can, can speak into those voids, into my knowledge gaps, and make me aware of things that I might not be as sensitive to. So I think it's uh, an ongoing enterprise. When, when we decide, you know, one of the one of the, the paradigms that I think works against us is this idea that there is a finish line. There is no finish line in, in relationships. And when we're talking about human beings, we're talking about relationships. We're talking about uh, something that is dynamic and that is moving and changing and evolving. And as soon as I believe that I have captured what it is, then it's changing again. Let me give you an example. 
um, there are generally speaking two distinct phases of the civil rights movement. There is the Martin Luther King nonviolent phase of the movement, which predominated and through, you know, through the end of the 1950s, early 60s. And then there's more of the Malcolm X revolutionary by any means necessary phase of the civil rights movement. That was really kind of early 60s and forward. So if you look at the footage and the imagery of that period, um, if you think Rosa Parks, that's 1955, right? You think, uh, you, you think about the, um, uh, the, the bus boycott and the, the grassroots mobilization around that. And you really see people who are, uh, who are very, very compliant with a, a kind of sense of, you know, kind of an order. And, uh, you know, if we're on our best behavior, then we're going to crack this wall of racism. Go a little bit further, few, few years down the road, where you get a new generation of African-Americans who do not have that perspective, who instead believe that their way is to become much more assertive and much more forceful and much more, uh, and in some cases, much more militant in their message and search for equality. Unless the people who were most at home with phase one of the civil rights movement evolved to empathize with the perspective of phase two of the civil rights movement, then I think that we'd probably be in a very different place. So I think that our, our, our mandate as scholars uh, is to be lifelong learners, remove the finish line, and instead think about the accumulation of knowledge as an ongoing cycle where we never get finished. We're always learning. Absolutely, fantastic point. Um, one comment here, uh, thanks you for, for this really well-reasoned analysis of this, this phenomenon. Um, and ask, uh, could you sh share your thoughts on reparations and how to help mitigate the effects of 400 years of white supremacy? You know, thank you very much. There are many, there are a couple of ways that people think about reparations. Sometimes the, con the, the conversation about reparations for some people gets overwhelming because you are thinking about a huge huge, huge, huge debt. But there are many institutions, particularly colleges and universities, who are beginning to enact reparations where they are in their own spaces, in their own institutions, using the power and the resources they have at hand. Some people react uh, negatively to that word, but it really is quite simple. Imagine going to a job every day for weeks, let's not even say years or centuries, let's just say weeks. And uh, imagine that you were doing the work and that you didn't get paid. You know, e every one of us can relate to what that would feel like to do the work for a week or two weeks or a month and you're expecting something, compensation. You know, many of us have contracts, right? Which protect us and tell us that in exchange for this work, you are going to get this compensation. Imagine how it would feel if you didn't get that compensation. Not only that you didn't get that compensation for the work that you did, but that your lack of compensation was passed to your posterity from one generation to the next generation to the next generation so that you end up with a situation of not just loss within your lifetime, but you end up with a situation of systemic intergenerational perpetual loss. Um, we know that, that time and money are good friends, right? So think about the fact that um, life insurance was a pretty new phenomenon in the late 19th century. Um, one of the things that I do for fun is collect antique books. And I have a, a book from 1856 that is written to a population learning for the first time what life insurance is. And it gives wonderful illustrations about, you know, here was a parson and then, you know, his house burned down and he didn't insure his life. But here's this other guy that insured his life and therefore his, his, his home and his family were protected after his death and he had a little money left over. Well, think about money invested in 1856 when African-Americans were not allowed to read or write or accumulate money and invest money, generally speaking, but that their white counterparts were. And think about what $1,000 would mean invested 
1856 and then passed down from one generation to the next so that in 2021, what was $1,000 in 1856 is a much bigger amount, giving much better security, giving many more opportunities, giving much more access. Think about the denial of that for someone who was an enslaved African-American and the kind of loss that that represents. I think that calls upon us really to just look at what's ethical and what's fair and what is what we would want for ourselves. We've got a, another question that's following up on our, our previous one uh, about um, ways to, to, to convene this conversation. Um, and so I think your point about intergeneral, intergenerational relationships is crucial. Uh, how might those of us um, without academic connections, without the, 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 the campus, um, uh, pursue that um, and with, with respect and deference? I love the, the way that that finished. You know, um, I am a lover of people. I'm also a realist. <laughs> I know that, you know, I'm happy to be on this call, but I do have this other job that takes up a, a, a lot of time. But, you know, I, I love the, the gift of, of interacting with people, especially people who view that we can really transcend our, our differences across race and we can, we can really build friendships. Now, maybe that's pie in the sky idealistic, but I really believe that's true. So for, for the person who asked that question, I'm easy to find, let's plan to go to lunch. It may take me a couple months, but I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll make good on my promise. Don't even have to go to an airport and buy coffee. There you go. How fantastic is that? Um, all right, I, I, I want to, to flip back to one of the, the pre-submitted questions. Um, and, and, and please, we've got a little bit more time. So if you do have uh, some more questions for Dr. Reed, get them into the chat. Um, does the Black Lives Matter movement oppose law enforcement? This is something that we've, we've mm -hmm. seen quite a bit in our public discourse lately. Okay, so let me ask, answer that question by asking us to do a little exercise. If you have a piece of paper and a pen or if your, your smartphone is handy, I'd like you to, to do this little exercise. I'd like you to write the words, lives matter. Just a two word sentence and sort of, you know, sit with that for a moment, lives matter. And, and think about how that feels. Then I'd like you to write animals, lives matter. Think about how that feels. Sit with that for a moment. Then write plants, lives matter. Think about how that feels. Now write black lives matter. And I'd like you to compare the difference, if there is one, between how it feels to write lives matter and how it feels to write black lives matter. And if there is a difference. If it feels somehow uncomfortable, that sentence, those three words, Black Lives Matter, then we have to understand that that comes from centuries of conditioning. Black lives were property in this country for hundreds of years. Black lives were commodities. Black lives were objects. And that has not entirely disappeared. We have to reckon with that reality. Now, let me get to the question of law enforcement. I, my young nephew is on the police force here in Louisville, and I'm incredibly proud of him. Um, he, he wears the badge, and, and uh, he is uh, a, an officer of the law. And yet I know that if my nephew changes out of his police uniform and puts on a hoodie and walks into a Thornton's at 11 o'clock at night, suddenly his life is much more vulnerable suddenly he takes on the profile of someone who is deemed suspicious and suddenly his safety becomes much different than it would be if he were not wearing that uniform. So Black Lives Matter is not in opposition to law enforcement. It is in support of a realization that human lives have value and it underscores that with regard to Black Lives because the traditions and the mores and the customs of this country traditionally have not. Thank you very much for that. 
Um, well, seeing uh, no other questions in the, the chat, I'll close with one of my own. I'll reserve that privilege to myself. Um, I, I appreciate that, that you've so very thoughtfully answered these questions about how do, how do we as individuals, as, as, as campuses move forward. Um, I'll ask a selfish question on behalf of the Filson Historical Society. What should the Filson be doing um, in the next few years to help um, advance this understanding and close this knowledge gap? That is our purpose after all. That is a really good question. You know, years ago, before I knew that I would be at U of L, I actually came to the Filson on a research trip and uh, spent a few days combing through the collections. Of course, this, this was probably maybe 20 years ago and was really fascinated by uh, the many wonderful primary sources that you have in your collection, which I would imagine are more extensive than they were when I was there as a visitor. I think it would be fascinating to create conversations around primary sources because primary sources are, 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 are snapshots of, of time. They, they, they speak for themselves and yet um, we need help contextualizing them and understanding what we're holding in our hands, whether it's a letter or a newspaper clipping or a broadside or whatever it is, we need help understanding the context. But I think much can be gained about um, much understanding across racial lines could be achieved by creating conversations, putting those artifacts in the center because they do immediately connect us to history. And history has a lot to do with where we are now. So I, I would enjoy that as an enterprise if the Filson decided to take that up. Absolutely. Nothing more sounds, uh, sounds like more fun to me. Um, Dr. Reed, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We've got one last comment in the chat that says um, that, uh, that they wish that this would be shared widely. It can be. This recording will be up on our YouTube page. So everyone in the audience, please, please share it. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Dr. Reed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.